Now, this morning, I want to share with you, as I shared last week, about light. I want to share about love and liberty. They might seem like concepts that are abstract, a bit nebulous, and you wonder how you can wrap yourself around them. They might be concepts that you would consider to be not all that relevant, all that pertinent. We all do it. We all express it. We all experience it. So what's the big deal? Why do we have to describe it, define it, and better understand it, especially in the context of the Bible? I've got it. I understand love, and I think I'm experiencing liberty. At least I'm not encased. I'm not uh, in prison. I'm not incarcerated. I'm not confined or restricted, or there's no boundaries around me. So I figure by my own personal experience, I'm experiencing liberty and freedom. Well, I want to share with you what I believe the Bible teaches so clearly about some areas that have become so distorted in America, in our culture, in our society. We've become intoxicated with so much deception. Darkness has descended with such intensity and such density that we don't even know where we're going. And the church has become blind as well. And I believe that the Lord is awakening us and giving us a deeper, richer, more profound understanding of what he wants to do in us and through us. That our identity is rooted in the fact that we are a son and a daughter of the Most High. And our destiny is not defined by our livelihood, our occupation, our profession, or even our education. It is defined by being a servant of the living God and reaching out with that heart unto others. We want to be everything that God Almighty has called us to be. We have to walk in light. And as we walk in that light, as I shared that last week, especially with the recent decision of the Supreme Court, there are individuals in the gay community have come out and basically said, wow, love now wins. Love wins. We've even heard from an individual that used to be a preacher. Now he's a consultant to Oprah. And he shares that these letters that were penned 2,000 years ago are no longer relevant This is not God's word. It's not inerrant. It's not infallible. And it has no power really now to change a life. What a foolish lie and deception right out of the pit of hell. This is the word of Almighty God. And it has the power to change and transform a life. I remember in my own personal journey, I had to cross many bridges. The bridge of reason and understanding to really know could this possibly be God's word, inerrant, infallible, inspired to change and transform my life. As Holy Scripture says, God's word is living and it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Yet I felt it was in competition with other religious textbooks, other literary works. I wondered how in the world could the Bible stand out higher, stronger, bigger, and greater than any other book. When you think of Muhammad, when he was asked, what miracle will you perform To validate the religion that you've brought, he said, well, the miracle that I will perform is to give to you the Quran. He doesn't actually write it himself. He gets it from what he considered an angelic host. I would say it was a demonic force that descended into his mind, and then he articulated it, and then his disciples, his devotees would write it down and gave to us the Quran. So I wondered, could the Quran have the power to change or transform a life? Or if you're of a Hindu background, you consider the Vedic writings and the Bhagavad Gita, and you consider these writings, do they have the potential to change life? And so I had to walk across many reasonable bridges to discern and to try to understand intellectually with my cerebral region. But boy, I'll tell you what, after I crossed those bridges, I came to this bridge called Revelation. And that moment when the Holy Spirit enlightened my heart, illuminated my mind, and an epiphany happened in my spirit, that I knew, that I knew, that I knew that this is God's Word, and it has the power to change a life. I speak that to you authentically and with deep conviction, because I know the power of God's Word. And God's Word has something to say about love. Even though this individual by the name of Rob Bell in his book called Love Wins, articulating a theology that is absolute heresy, it's universalism, it's the idea that there's really no judgment, there's no hell, there's no final course in which God will cast us into a place of punishment, judgment, or consequence. No, no, God is benevolent, all-loving, and he wins. Not only does he win over all of mankind, he wins over all the demons and Satan himself. That's called and defined in the area of theology, universalism. 
That's not found in the Bible. That might be found in his book, but not in the Bible. And Jesus told us, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain for eternity. God's word is everlasting. And so when someone like Robert Bell defines love, when our society defines love, even in the context of Christendom, when they give a definition based on the Greek word that's used in the New Testament, agape. They say it's an unconditional love. But for many Christians, this, that has translated into this idea of a broad acceptance and approval of all. That is not agape New Testament love. That is not the teachings of the New Testament. And I want to refine that. I want to give a deeper, richer, and more profound understanding of that as we look into Holy Scripture. Because there's an aspect of love that we absolutely disengage from. We forget that it transcends just a feeling. If you look at the definitions, the workable definitions that are given in any dictionary that you pick up, you'll find it describes love in very deep emotions, a tender heartedness, a warm feeling to another. It's the feeling of like that's on steroids that has evolved into this idea of love. And they even define it in the context of sex and passion. And when you read those definitions of love, some are valid, some are credible, but they're not all-encompassing, and they definitely are not underscored fully and completely by the Bible in what the Bible has to say about what is love. Oh, it incorporates a feeling, an emotion, a sense of concern or compassion or care, but it's far more than that. And sometimes we say, well, it's a choice that we make. It's an action verb. We make a choice. Yes, it definitely incorporates that. But the Bible teaches us that the very essence, the very nucleus, the very substance of love is the character and nature of Almighty God. And the greatest manifestation of that character of Almighty God was seen at Calvary. You cannot push that off the table. The cross and what Jesus did there represents the full manifestation of God's agape, unconditional love, and it incorporated standards, holiness, consequence, judgment, and mercy. We have to understand God's love based on what the Bible describes and defines is love. It's far more, supersedes just a mere affection, a warm feeling, a caring concern, tenderness, or passion, more than a choice. It has to do with the character of Almighty God and the attributes that are associated with his character. And when you speak about love, you have to realize that the Bible also describes love in terms of not just what's being expressed and the content of character, but it has to do with the direction of love, the object of love, what you are loving. Remember last week we read from John 3, not verse 16, but verse 19. That portion of Scripture declared this, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come, that light is Jesus, into this world. And men, listen, men in a generic sense, that's men and women, men loved darkness. Men loved darkness. There's some individuals that are involved in an affair and they say, I can't help it. I love her. She's just kind of my other self. The wife I have just doesn't meet all my needs. This woman emotionally and intellectually and sexually and every area meets my needs. I, I love her. And somehow that statement seems to justify the adultery or the affair or validate it in their mind and numb and sear their conscience. Love. Well, it's not just love, but the direction, the motion the object of what is being loved that can violate what God says. A man to a man, we hear that in our society in the context of the gay movement that says, listen, I love him and he loves me. And somehow just that idea of love validates this experience. Well, hear me, especially when these have become coined terms that are very popular. This idea that, well, what we want is is liberty, we want diversity, we want equality. 
Well, God says, I want morality. Yes, there's something important about diversity and equality. But there's something so much more important about morality, living a godly life as a believer. Now, with the world, they don't know better. That's why we have to get out there and be the light and be the salt and be the hands and the feet and the voice of Christ. It's a lost generation. And so we don't try to resurrect some political statement that's going to do it. No, it's the power of the gospel. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. It's the gospel that is the power unto salvation. That we proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we bring light and his love into that situation. But when someone says, as a believer... Listen, it's validated by the fact that there's the presence of love. And if there's the presence of love, therefore, it must be God, and it must be okay, and it must be fine. Well, the Bible says these men, these women, they loved, but they loved the darkness. It was the motion, the direction, the object of love that became the point of displeasure to God, judgment from God. They loved darkness. So it wasn't just the mere presence of love that validated or made credible the idea that God must be here because it involves love. Their superimposed definition from society and from within themselves have defined what love is, but even in its description here, the love that was being expressed was toward darkness. You read in 1 Timothy, in chapter 2, it says, and they love the world. And in 1 Timothy, chapter 6, it speaks about they loved money. So love can be expressed. But if it's not directed toward God and obedience to Him, the Scripture says you're walking in darkness. They loved darkness. They enveloped darkness, went to bed with darkness, wrapped their arms around darkness, embraced darkness, got under the sheets with darkness. They loved. Oh, there was the presence of love. But it was love for darkness or the love of money or the love of the world. Jesus even challenges us in the Gospels when he says, hey, your love has got to transcend even the love you have for your mom and dad. You must love me above all else. Above all else. I'm the object of your love. Now, love in the Bible, there's four Greek words that are used to describe love. Three of them are used in the Bible. In a moment, I'm going to zero in on the agape love, but a biblical understanding of that. So let me ask you a personal question. It's, it's, it's a rhetorical question. It's to invite you to reflect and consider how do you understand and define and describe God's love? Now, we know our society and culture will describe it as tolerant of everything. Isn't that God's love? It's broad. It's wide. It's all-encompassing, approving of everything, Without any expectations, without any judgment. That's how our society describes or defines love. No standards, no conditions, no rejection, and definitely no consequence. That's God's love. That's the kind of love that the world says wins. That love that is eclectic open-minded, broad in its thought, no restrictions, standards, no absolutes, no consequence, definitely no judgment. Is that biblical love? Is that the love that Holy Scripture describes to us? Is that the love of the one who hung on a cross that is the most profound demonstration and manifestation of God's love? What was present there was there the presence of sin? Was there judgment upon that sin? Was there consequence there? Was there a standard being established there? 
Was there rejection being experienced there? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here's the greatest manifestation of love. The explosion of love. Love in technicolor that you can see and feel and hear and embrace. It was pulsating at Calvary. And that love contained the very character and attributes of Almighty God. A love that had righteousness and holiness and standards and absolutes and conditions and consequence. That's biblical love. That's God's love. Scripture says God is love. The syntax, the arrangement of the words is very important here. It doesn't say love is God. It says God is love. Therefore, God's character and his attributes are pressed into our definition of love. And when we look at that, we realize that God's love then is defined and described by his character. And when you read through the Old and New Testament, you'll, you have to embrace this reality. God's love, it is sacred, sacred and holy, undefiled, but it is also sacrificial it reaches constantly, unrelenting in its reach, in its concern, in its care, in its extension of help and provision and healing and deliverance. Yes, God's love, it's, it's a place of safety, but his love is severe. It expresses itself through compassion, but it's also most confronting. God's love is friendly and it's fierce. It contains mercy and justice. And as I said, it never stops giving and never stops reaching and never stops forgiving. You see, God's agape love, that unconditional love, is not, please hear me, this is biblical and this is the truth of his word. And you've got to get your mind washed from the way our society describes love in the broadest, most general sense. And then the love that's associated with God. When even Christian leaders will say, well, God's love, it's unconditional. That does not mean that it improves and accepts everything. But his love helps and provides for everyone. You see, when we speak of God's unconditional agape love, we are speaking of the fact that God shows no partiality. The Bible describes us, when we fall, we fall into sin. And when we fall in that state, we need someone to lift us up and pull us out. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it with the muscle of our own good works. We cannot get ourselves up. This condition for you, for me, for all of us as a sinner needs a Savior. And that Savior came and expressed his love. The scripture says in John 3, 16, the most familiar portion of scripture, God so loved the world that he gave us, his only begotten son. But how does the Lord extend his love to us? When we are in that fallen state, God reaches to us with a hand. But that hand has been labeled by liberal society and liberal theologians as a hand that has imprinted upon it approval and acceptance. And all it does is it leaves us in that state and just takes hold of our hand and says, I accept you and I approve of you. You just go ahead and stay in that fallen condition. And even though the world might look at this as fallen, you're not. You're fulfilling your identity, your personality, your uniqueness. There's diversity here. There's equality here. And you can be just the way you are. You see, that's the hand. It's unconditional, isn't it? Unconditional. That means I accept and approve no matter who you are or what you do. No, the Bible teaches us that God's agape love, his unconditional love, is the reach of a hand that has written upon it help and provision and forgiveness and deliverance to whosoever. In other words, the whosoever, the unconditional dynamic or, 
or reality is the person who lies there if they are whatever race they are, whatever ethnicity, whatever nationality, whatever their education is, if they're illiterate or well-educated, no matter if they're wealthy or poor, no matter what perversion they may have fallen into, what their past is, it doesn't matter. God's reach extends to them unconditionally, unrelenting, ready to do what? Approve? No. Accept? No. Save, deliver, help, provide, heal, and pull them up. That's his mighty hand of love. That's why this hand of God pulsates with justice and mercy and righteousness and holiness because his holiness brings wholeness to a broken, fragmented life. God comes with that kind of love. I know that some of you, there's different sins, and they're all on the table. Arrogance and pride and envy and jealousy and selfishness and greed and lust and lying, adultery and homosexuality. They're all on the table. But no matter who it is that has found themselves in that place, God has an unrelenting reach And he won't ever give up as he extends himself unconditionally, not based on who it is, how many times they've fallen, where they're at, what perversion has entangled their life, what their gender is, or if they don't even understand who they are, he keeps reaching to them. I don't know, maybe for you, you have a loved one. Maybe it's a brother, a sister. Maybe it's an aunt or an uncle, a a niece or a nephew. I have a loved one in my life. He knows with everything in me, I love him. I reach to him. It doesn't matter at all. I will never stop reaching. Never. That he would know God's reach of love to bring help and deliverance and provision. I would lay down my life for him. But I will not bring in this hand indifference, apathy, or confusion, or deception, or lies. I will bring in this hand truth and say, if you remain in this sin, you will die and come under the judgment of Almighty God because the truth, only the truth, can set you free. Yes, reach with God's love. And when you really reach with God's love, you won't pet, you won't pat, you'll reach with a fierceness of heart that says, I'll lay down my life for you. I love you with the love that God has. And I reach to you with everything in me. But this hand is a hand that reaches not approving of this lifestyle but to help you and to see healing and deliverance and salvation in your life. I bring in my hand, not confusion or deception or lies. I bring you the truth. Would you bring your loved one the truth? This world is all distorted. You'll be labeled a bigot, but get beyond that. Remember what Jesus said in John 7, 7, they hated me because I spoke of the evil of the world. But he spoke of the evil not to come and mock and belittle. He came to save and deliver and heal and help and restore. And so may that be in your heart. May that pulsate in your whole being. I think of it in relationship maybe to your own walk with God. Have you blown it a few times? Have you found yourself on your back? Maybe if you're like me, you can be pretty hard on yourself. And maybe when you look at you laying there, you'll say, you know what? I'm so sick and tired of you, Gary. Man, you did that again. You blew it again. See, our love can be very conditional. But God's love isn't. 
So as you lie there, you can rely on the fact that, no, his love, his agape, unconditional love doesn't mean he approves. But he has a heart that is unrelenting and will never, ever give up and pull you back up. You may not give that grace to yourself, but he's there. You may not even want to reach to you and say, you know what? I'm throwing in the towel down for the last time. I'm embarrassed. I'm mortified. I'm humiliated. This is it. I don't like you at all. Have you ever said that to yourself? Wow, I didn't know you guys had it all together. <laughs> well, I'm going to be transparent and give you a window into my soul. There's been times when I've been so disappointed with me. So disappointed with me. And my love for me was conditional. It was like, you know what? I don't like you, Gary Z, anymore. I said, you're staying there. You're just going to stay there. I'm so glad that God doesn't love us even the way we love ourselves. He keeps reaching. That's the unconditional. Doesn't matter about your past or perversion or how long you've been there or how many times you've got yourself there. I'm going to keep reaching to you. I'm going to keep reaching to you. Till the day you die, I'm going to keep reaching to you. Who is God saying that to you right now? He's reaching to you right now. Not to pat you, but to heal you. Not to leave you there, but to pull you upright. The Bible also speaks about liberty. Here's the mystery that's built into liberty. Again, here in our society, they define liberty as, hey, no responsibilities, no points of connection, no incarceration, nothing that holds me down, holds me back, no restrictions, no boundaries. I want to move free. I'm liberated to be whoever I am whenever I want to be that. We can run around, as I said last week, you can jump off the Empire State Building and start shaking your hands and feet saying, I'm free, I'm free, I'm so free. And that sudden stop just shows you how bound you really were. You might run around in the Arctic without any attire in your underwear. And say, I'm free. Well, some polar bear is going to sneak up behind you in your history. <laughs> what is that freedom? What is that liberty? Could you imagine suddenly a plant becomes alive? If I were to personify a plant, it just jumps out of the soil. It's disconnected from the soil. And with its root system, it starts like little dancing legs, starts dancing on my pulpit, starts dancing across here, and says, I'm free, I'm liberated. No longer am I connected to soil. You know I'm going to look at it and say, you are on a path to death. You're going to die because you're disconnected. You think you're free. But you're disconnected. You have set yourself for a path of death. It's only a matter of time. I know you look lively now. Look green and colorful. But you're going to wither. You decay. And you're going to die. Because you are disconnected. See, the scripture says that sin brings death. The Greek word thanatos means to split or to separate. We engage in sin no matter what it is. It splits us. It separates us. You won't have an identity or a personality or the fulfillment of your destiny. You're split. You're up. You're down. You're left. You're right. And so the Bible encases our understanding of true liberty and true freedom, but it uses a paradox. At first, it would become repulsive, even rejecting to our society. Because it says, if you want to be free, you have to be a slave. The Greek word that's used is doulos. The chapter that I refer to is Romans chapter 6. It says, at one time you were a slave of sin, now you're a slave of righteousness, a slave of God. The apostle Paul defines it in Ephesians 4.1 as a prisoner of the Lord. Now, you're not connected to a chain because that is bondage. 
If you're connected to a hand, that's relationship to Christ. But you are connected. When the world looks on, it looks like bondage. It looks like slavery. It looks like you've been incarcerated. You have to adhere to all these commands and all these promises and all these restrictions. Boy, you can have that. I don't like Christendom. It's all those do's and don'ts, and you're all bound up, and you stay there. Because that's the lens they're looking through. When you realize, wow, God's commands come to protect me, his promises come to release me, to fulfill my potential, then I embrace them wholeheartedly, completely. I am absolutely, here's the paradox, I am absolutely and completely free when I am connected and the slave of Christ. When you lose your life, you will find it. That is a mystery. It is a paradox. It seems like an apparent contradiction. It seems like an advocating tyranny. But his lordship brings complete freedom and liberty. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. It set free from sin and having become slaves of God, Romans 6, 22. The liberty by which Christ has made us free, Galatians 5, 1. Can I invite you to be connected with Jesus at Gethsemane? If I were to make this practical. Did you, do you notice what happened in Gethsemane? There were two things. There were some sleeping and some surrendering. Actually, there was only one surrendering. The others were sleeping. We are in a society today that no longer is it comfortable to be a Christian. No longer is it convenient. And that won't be, I'm going to tell you this. Diane shared with me yesterday. She said, well, maybe you should just challenge the body that they need to realize deep in their heart this is no longer a time to be comfortable. This is no longer a time of convenience. And I said, sweetheart, I absolutely agree with you, but I don't think I have to preach it or teach it. You know why? There is a wave that is going to descend upon every single life here, every single life that you're going to make a choice. It will either author in you surrender or you're going to want to go to sleep. You're going to either get up, be awake and alert, and move forward to what God wants you to do, and it's beyond an issue of comfort or convenience because you won't even have it as a choice anymore. Circumstances are going to collide so hard, so strong with you, that it won't be comfortable anymore. Not because someone preached it. Circumstances have enveloped your life. It's no longer comfortable, no longer convenient, but you've got a choice in that environment, just like the disciples, they were pulled into Gethsemane. It was no longer comfortable Christianity. Everybody wasn't rejoicing that Jesus had come. There was no longer a celebration at Bethlehem. Now it was tough. It was sacrificial. It was suffering. It was their master seeing him bleed with sweat. It wasn't a comfortable environment. Not for one moment. Nor was it convenient. And they had a choice, and they made the wrong one. They went to sleep. You know, you might go to sleep with some coping mechanism to avoid reality. For you, it might be the sleep of apathy or passivity or an insipid will. It might be the sleep of distractions or entertainment or athletics. It might be the sleep of material possessions. I don't know. It might be the sleep of lust. It might be the sleep of some pleasure or some pill or some drink or some drug to somehow help you not face reality. Psychologists will actually indicate that if a person has a strong propensity toward slumber and sleep, it could be a clear indication that they're severely depressed. Does their they may not be overeating or drinking or smoking or taking a drug or some pleasure or fantasy to get them out of reality. So they just try to avoid reality and they don't even realize it physiologically. They just want to go to sleep. They just constantly want to go to sleep, go to sleep. Because they're so deeply depressed. You have a choice. God, I refuse to give in to the sleep of any coping mechanism in my life. I surrender to you. There I will find my strength and my comfort and my shalom 
Now, shalom or peace is not tranquility. It's the stability that we get in God, that when we face troubled waters, we can keep on walking and keep our head up and stay strong in him and the strength of his might. That's the shalom of God. But the only place that will come is you being connected to Jesus in Gethsemane in a position of surrender. And you might say, here's another paradox. In a place of surrender, you'll find complete victory. In war, surrender, waving the white flag means you gave up and you lost. Not in the kingdom. Surrender to God means you've just won. You gained absolute victory. Because you're connected to him. Be connected to him at Calvary, a place where you have to die to yourself. You die to your own drives and your own desires and your own dreams. Pastor, is that self-destruction? No. That's biblical self-denial. That's the yielding of your will and your ways and your ambitions and your hopes and your desires and your dreams unto God. And saying, Lord, I die to myself that your will would manifest through my life. There and only there will you be able to end your life with this. It is finished. I've accomplished not my will, but God's will for my life. Are you going to be connected to your career? You might say, well, yeah, I did this and did that. Most people that I talk to on their deathbed, they're not rejoicing too much about that, believe me. When you connect with the cross and with Calvary, and you say, Lord, help me to die to my own will so that only your will would manifest through me. And if you're not sure what that is, ask him, meet with him, talk with him, so that at the end of your life, you'll be connected with, it is finished. I've accomplished God's will on my life when I exit this earth. And when you do that, you'll be connected to his resurrection power. That power that will flow through your life. You know, yesterday when Diane and I walked through Central Park, we saw so many different lifestyles. Men kissing men, women kissing women. People that were just out there doing their own thing and living their own lifestyle, their own way. And I thought, oh God, they're so beyond the reach. My reach, yes. Diane's reach, yes but not the reach of God's agape love. We saw hundreds. We saw thousands. We were walking through there praying because there was going to be a great evangelistic crusade that afternoon with Luis Palau and the ministry that was going to go forward. We wanted to be there praying, but oh, the burden that was just overtaking my heart. And I began to say to the Lord, I said, Lord, it just seems so overwhelming. Our, Our society right now, The depravity of our society, the decay of our society, the darkness of our society in every arena, ethics and mores in every area. And we listen, in Christendom, we've been so sloppy with our marriages. So sloppy. So disobedient. And so even in, in the church, in the world, And I said, Lord, it seems like it's so beyond. And he just reminded me again, you walk in my message. You let my love, my unconditional love beat within your soul that will reach out to other lives. You let that light, you stand in the light away from the darkness without any apology, without any compromise. Live by those convictions and those core values that I've built into you. Walk in the light. and Live in the light. And in the liberty that comes by you being connected to me, Gary, at Gethsemane. You be connected to me. Surrender everything to me. Be connected to me at Calvary. Die to yourself and be alive to me. And I'll allow you to be connected to me at the empty tomb. And my resurrection power will flow through your life. And I believe what he's saying to me, he's saying to you. Yes, this society seems to be beyond the reach of apologetics and polemics and the debate that comes from, yeah, here's what Christianity says and here's what a Muslim says and a Hindu says and and all that, all the talk. And I'm not minimizing the value of it. I've been engaged in that study to be prepared for that. It seems to be so beyond, you know, technology and just trying to be more contemporary and relevant as a church or with a facility 
It seems so beyond the reach of any sermon, and I'm preaching one now, I understand, and any song, well sung, it said, Lord, it seems so beyond that reach to get to this fallen world. And then he said, I want you tomorrow to pray with the church for my hand to reach. My hand that will be filled with signs and wonders and healing and miracles. The same way the first century church that walked in light, that walked in love, that walked in liberty, they walked in that power that came from God Almighty. So I'm going to ask you if you would, would you please stand and work together. And I'm going to ask you with your whole heart, don't wander every child in here, every teenager, every young adult, every young person, every single person, every married couple, every senior citizen or senior saint. I'm going to ask you just close your eyes. And my, I, I feel so strongly commissioned by God. This is what he told me yesterday. Have the church together in agreement with you then. Pray for the reach that will come from my hand. My hand that will be filled with supernatural wonders, signs, and miracles. My hands that will bring literal instantaneous healing to a broken body a broken mind, and a broken soul. I want you to agree with me as I pray this. And when we speak about these threats, it doesn't mean God give us some weapons so we can hurt the people that are hurting us or these threats that have come against us. No, no. It's when we say, Lord, remember the threats that are spinning and spiraling around the church, from the media, from this culture, from this society, from this world. It's that, God, you'd give us the power to reach to them. And see them delivered and snatched from the hand of the devil. With your eyes closed and your heart in agreement with me, Father in heaven, I know that you are. Your presence is here with us in this place. I lift this prayer to you in agreement with these saints in the 21st century as they prayed this prayer in the first century. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Stretching out your hand <laughs> to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So let it be. So let it descend upon us, this church, and each of us as your sons and daughters, as we purpose to walk in the light, filled with your love and the liberty of your spirit. May your hand now flow through each and every one of us with signs, wonders, miracles, healing, and power. For your glory in Jesus' name. And let us in unison with our whole heart say, Amen. So let it be, O oh God. So let it be. And now may the blessing of Almighty God descend over your mind and over your heart, your hands, and your feet. May you be flooded with light and have the power of His unrelenting reach of unconditional love and his liberty flowing through you to touch this generation with his hand of power. I pray this blessing on you. Be ready to be used mightily by God in Jesus' name. Would you say, I receive this. So let it be. God bless you.